So thank you very much for inviting me to speak at your conference and enabling me to do this uh, by video. I'm unable to travel because I have um, a chronic condition at the moment, but hopefully I'll be able to attend one of your conferences in the future as it sounds like you've got a very exciting programme. So today I've been invited to talk to you on the topic of work, worklessness and health inequalities, something which uh, I've written about a lot, including a book published by Oxford University Press. So I want to set out an argument that has two aspects to it. Firstly, that paid work or the lack of paid work is the most important determinant of public health and health inequalities in advanced uh, market democracies like Canada or the UK. And secondly, I want to argue that the influence of, that work has on health and health inequalities varies importantly by welfare state context. So just to give a brief overview of how the talk will go, I'm going to just quickly touch upon what are health inequalities, because I don't, I, I don't know if everyone in the audience, this is something that's familiar to them. I'll then start talking about how different aspects of the work environment, the physical work environment and the psychosocial work environment, contribute to health and health inequalities. I'll then talk a little bit about unemployment and its role in health inequalities, and also the issue of health-related worklessness, so people who are out of work and perhaps claiming a disability pension, or as we'd refer to it in, in the UK, uh, incapacity benefit or employment and support allowance. And I'm then going to end by talking about the comparative perspective, where I'm going to argue that actually these relationships that work has and the importance that it plays in terms of public health and health inequalities varies by a wider political economy context, in this case the issue of welfare states. I'll be drawing on a wide range of work uh, to underpin my argument and I'll present that as we go along. So firstly, what is health inequality? And some of you may be familiar with this uh, definition from uh, Margaret Whitehead, who of course is, is very famous for her work in this area. And she argues that health inequality are systematic differences in health between different socioeconomic groups within a society. Because they are socially produced, they are potentially avoidable and widely considered unacceptable in a civilised society. And I think the thing that I would like to emphasise here is obviously the socio-economic inequalities is what we're focusing on rather than gender or race, but also this issue of the fact that they're socially produced. And I will argue that they're produced through the work, through, through work, through lack of work, through the work environment, and also more broadly through the welfare state context, so the wider political economy context within which work or lack of work takes place and how supported people are within a workplace and how supported they are by the system if they're unable to find work for whatever reason. So you can see these two maps here on my slides just to give a demonstration of health inequalities uh, within England for example and you can see um, here's a map of England and uh, this is a life expectancy for men and women and areas that are highlighted in red or orange have a much lower life expectancy of around 10 years than those areas that are in a pale or a bright green. In England, this is referred to quite famously as the north-south divide in health. And you can see that there are quite stark spatial differences reflecting differences in the socio-economic status of these areas. So the north is generally a poorer part of the country than the south of England. Even within regions, though, you can see that there are um, inequalities within regions, and of course these can also differ. So in this graph here, which is from the uh, Marmot Review of Health Inequalities in England, a government uh, commissioned report, you can see that the darker line with triangles refers to the southwest of England, and the, and the lighter green is referring to the northeast of England. And we can see that the um, socioeconomic gradient, so the difference between, say, managerial and professional groups as opposed to routine, um, more manual jobs, is actually a, a bigger gap in, in uh, mortality rates in the northeast region than in the southwest region. So this is just to give you an example of health inequalities. And I know from work from people like some of your colleagues like Dennis Raphael at York University in Toronto and Carlos Montaner at Toronto, that the patterns of health inequalities in Canada are quite similar to those that we find within England. So why does work, how does work contribute to these health inequalities that we can see socioeconomically and, and, and perhaps also spatially? <clears throat> 
Well, firstly, I want to think about the physical work environment. Now, often people don't tend to, particularly in uh, health inequalities research or in public health, they don't tend to focus on the physical work environment much these days. They tend to look at it as something that was important in the 19th century, maybe the 20th century, but with the move to a post-industrial service society within Western economies, perhaps it's less important. And this has led to a, a lack of discourse around it. Now, of course, it was very important in the 19th century, and I'm not going to pretend that we're in a situation now in the West as we were in the past. However, a significant minority, in, in my case, I tend to study European public health, a significant minority of the European workforce are still exposed to potentially hazardous physical work environments. And most importantly, these uh, work environments, the hazards, tend to be socially patterned. So people are more likely to be exposed if they're in um, lower skilled jobs than if they're in higher skilled jobs. And here in this chart you can see a bit of an example. This is taking data um, from a European survey of working conditions and it gives a percentage estimate of the EU workforce that are exposed to particular physical hazards. So we can see that um, handling chemicals, for example, around 15% of people are exposed to this and, and then so forth. If we look at something that's got a higher amount, uh, something, say, from the, the, the bottom of the chart, you can look at ergonomic stresses around repetitive work. You can see that the high risk work that, 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 where people are most exposed to this is around, for example, traditional assembly lines. But it would also come into something that might be seen as quite a symbol of the new service sector, which would be something like call centres or contact centres. And then we can see the sort of health effects that are associated with this, things like repetitive strain, uh, stress and anxiety, mental health problems, and of course musculoskeletal disease, um, arm and obviously back being most common. And we can see that actually there's a, a large amount of the workforce that are still exposed to what are physical hazards. Yes, they're different from what they were in the 19th century, but they're still physical and I still think they're important. As I've said, exposure to such uh, um, hazards in physical work environments is higher amongst lower skilled workers. And also importantly, and this is a pattern that we find with other things in terms of health inequalities, um, people's susceptibility to the health effects of such um, environments is stronger amongst um, lower skilled people. So in other words, um, if you're exposed to a hazardous environment and you're um, from a, a lower skilled job, you're more likely to end up with let's say the back pain, than if you're a higher um, educated person working in a similar environment. So there's a susceptibility issue, uh, something that's more complicated and which I won't touch upon today. But nonetheless, there is an argument to be made that um, the physical work environment contributes to health inequalities. And certainly this is something that I've been looking at work um, with colleagues such as Terry Ikemo from Norway um, and, and uh, Nico Dragano, who heads up her occupational health unit at the University of Dusseldorf and who may be a familiar name to some of you. In this chart, I'm, I'm, I, I demonstrate again using the same EU data set, we can see differences in, and it's just a percentage of regular exposure to people who are exposed more than 25% of their working time. Um, to these hazards. So if we take, for example, on the top line, handling chemical substances, then we can see that managers and senior officials are saying around 10% of, 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 of that group has a regular exposure. But if we look towards um, uh, the um, right of the slide, we can see that in elementary occupations, this is almost twice um, a, a, a prevalence rate is so almost 20% of people in those occupations are regularly exposed to handling chemical substances. The patterning is, might, is not quite so stark on some of the other ones, although we can see for something like heavy loads that, again, there's almost a, a doubling of, um, um, of risk in that sense. And, of course, shift work on the bottom, which, of course, has so many different health associations uh, alongside it. There was a recent study that showed that people's functioning and uh, brain age and their degeneration was uh, strongly associated with whether people worked irregular shifts or not, for example. We can see that shift work is almost 20% of elementary occupations as opposed to less than 10% in, um, in, in more senior roles. So the exposure to these hazards is higher amongst um, lower grade occupations.
And here's just an example of how that might play out in terms of actual health effects. And this is data um, from the UK around injury rates. And we can see that, for example, for all injuries, a much higher rate um, amongst people in the lowest, um, uh, lowest occupational groups, um, elementary and machine operatives, as opposed to those in the higher groups of, of managers and senior officials. So there's a patterning of exposure and a patterning of certain outcomes. More recent work that I've been involved in has also shown a relationship like this around factors such as um, self-reported health. It's more common these days to talk about things like the psychosocial work environment and how that might contribute to poorer health outcomes and to health inequalities. As I mentioned before, this is partly because of a move to a service economy and also I think because of a kind of realisation around the psychological pressures that um, modern living can tend to have. This has meant that public health uh, research has, has, has shifted quite a lot to looking at the work environment as a source of psychosocial stress rather than uh, as a source of material stress. And a particular thesis here that obviously has quite a lot of weight is the demand control support model, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Another angle of looking at it from a more political economy perspective might also to be think about the perhaps an increase in alienation from work and that this relates to the material conditions of production. So whether psychosocial theories are actually as new as they might suggest or whether they reflect a longer standing arguments uh, from a political economy perspective about alienation. So the demand control support model, as you can see in the diagram here, um, Karazak divided jobs into those that had high or low control and high or low demands. And some of the demands could be, um, as we discussed, rep repetition of work and having high volume of work. And control can be about whether you can pace your tasks, how much control you might have over your working hours and so on. And we can see that jobs that have low demands and high control are seen by Karazak as being low stress jobs and ones that shouldn't cause too much tension. However, on the other hand, if you have high amounts of demand and low amounts of control, then you have what are called high stress jobs. And these um, are more likely, it's hypothesised, to lead to adverse health outcomes. There's been a huge amount of research in this area. Um, perhaps most famously, the Whitehall studies but conducted by Sir Michael Marmot that look, have looked very much into the issue of demand control and support and its influence on health. And some of their results have been quite compelling and have been uh, replicated across studies in other parts of the world. And one of the main uh, associations between psychosocial stress in these um, high strain jobs is with cardiovascular disease. So a recent meta-analysis, for example, found that the risk, relative risk um, was at least 50% more and, and and up to a, a huge amounts if you were suffering from job strain uh, as a result of um, low control and high demands. Other studies have shown relationships with health behaviours, uh, with obesity and indeed also uh, a dose response was found so the, the, the more stress, workplace stress you experienced the more likely you were to have metabolic syndrome. There's a strong association being found between musculoskeletal disease and certain aspects of psychosocial stress, is particularly the case for lower back pain. And as one might expect, um, a, a, a relationship between mental health, adverse mental health outcomes and stressful work environments. So, for example, um, the Whitehall studies have found a 33% increased risk of psychiatric disorders amongst people who are experiencing job strain. How does this fit into health inequalities? Well, exposure to stressful work environments, so that is having high demands, low control, and perhaps a lack of social support from managers and colleagues, um, is higher amongst lower skilled workers. So again, similar to the physical work environment, we have these stresses within the workplace, and people who are lower educated or in a lower occupation are more likely to be exposed to them. And again, there's also that secondary issue of susceptibility. This is uh, data from the health survey for England, which was used by Marmot and Wilkinson. And as you can see, it shows a low control, a low variety and lack of social support. So this is very much looking at control and, um, and health outcomes. And we can see um, that in this is divided by social class, with one being uh, professional classes and five being um, the manual classes. And we can see that actually the rates of low control, uh, which is the white bars, 
the percentages there are, are, are goes up in a gradient so we can see that in the professional groups which is number one that they might be reporting less than 10 percent of people are reporting that they have low control over their work whereas in group five almost 50 percent of people are reporting a low control at work now the Whitehall studies investigated this um, in terms of what role does uh, control have in terms of inequalities in health within a workplace. And they particularly focused on cardiovascular disease. In their studies they found that heart disease was 50% higher in the lowest grade employees than it was in the highest grade employees. Initially they thought this must be to do with differences in alcohol, smoking, the usual lifestyle factors and proximal causes. So they adjusted for this and this reduced the inequalities uh, by 40% in men and 26% in women. But you're still looking at 60% and 75% of that difference unexplained by the model. Once they added in adjustment uh, for demand, control and support, so when they adjusted for differences in the psychosocial work environment, they found much bigger decreases. So inequalities uh, in uh, heart disease for men reduced by almost two thirds and by around 50% for women. So this led the authors of the paper, Marmot and colleagues, to conclude that the work environment was more important in this context than smoking or diet or alcohol. So these are quite huge um, findings we could argue, and obviously coming from a very robust uh, cohort study, one of the ones that's most famous in the world of public health. So I've talked there about the physical work environment as a, a material determinant of health and health inequalities, and then also a little bit about the psychosocial work environment and its role in creating job stress and strain, and how that can impact on health inequalities, particularly with reference to heart disease. In this next section, I want to talk about the issue of how lack of work can contribute to population health and health inequalities. And there are two aspects that I'm going to talk about, unemployment and then also health-related worklessness. I'll start with unemployment. It's well known, I think, in the literature because of the recessions of the early 80s and the early 1990s that there's a strong relationship between being unemployed and, in fact, a causal relationship between unemployment and um, adverse health outcomes. There's a very strong literature by people like Steve Platt at uh, University of Edinburgh who talked about the risk of suicide uh, and parasuicide um, being you know, five times or more higher amongst people who have experienced unemployment and particularly amongst young men. The mortality rate of people who are unemployed is roughly double that of people who have a job even when you control for other factors such as occupational class. Studies have shown um, worse self-reported health, limiting long-term illnesses, worse health behaviours amongst people who are unemployed. And other studies have shown that this ill health effect also extends to the families of people who are unemployed. There is a debate in the literature, however, about the mechanisms linking unemployment to poorer health. One argument is that it's psychosocial and that the stigma of being unemployed has an impact on people's health. And the other argument is that it's material and that because when people become unemployed, they have less resources, less finances and are, uh, are reliant on support from their family or from the state. And they become in many countries uh, impoverished by unemployment, that this is the important factor. So, for example, people can't afford a healthy diet would be one argument. Unemployment, um, very much the focus of research in the 80s and the 90s recessions. Currently, there's a lot more focus also on what could be seen as temporary or insecure work and the idea of the precariat, so people in precarious work. So this is people who are in and out of work, so they might not be counted as conventionally unemployed. In the UK, for example, there's been a lot of policy and political discussion about the issue of zero hours contracts, when people don't know whether from one day to another, whether they'll be coming into work or not. And with companies like um, quite high profile companies using such contracts become a real source of concern. Well, this kind of precarious work, which might not conventionally be seen as unemployment, but is certainly uh, very temporary and makes this population group very vulnerable. Amongst these groups, their mortality is 20% higher than people who are permanent employees. So I think this is very correct that this is a, a new agenda within health inequalities.
These bar charts here uh, give an example of the um, effects on mortality of people who experience un a period of unemployment. And this uses data um, and it shows people by socioeconomic class in, in 1981 um, and whether they're employed or whether they're unemployed. And these are mortality rates from 1992. So it's looking around 10 years later uh, at the death rates amongst people who were employed versus people who were unemployed. And it's showing here also um, the issue of whether it varies um, by socioeconomic class. So I've shown that unemployment is important for health. This chart is beginning to explore how is, it how is it important for inequalities in health. And the data again comes from the Marmot review that I mentioned earlier. And we can see um, in the uh, um, dark green the mortality rates for people who were employed in 1981. And there's a very clear um, social gradient, a step up the, uh, sorry, a step down the social ladder leads to a step up in mortality rates. And then what we can also see is that if you were unemployed in uh, 1981, that you have the same sort of social patterning, but much more of an effect, much larger mortality rates amongst people that were unemployed, and particularly for those people in social class 5, which is the lowest uh, socioeconomic uh, class. So there's a gradient for both, but the gradient is um, steeper and deeper within the unemployed group. So we can begin to see that unemployment uh, has a role within health inequalities. Another way in which um, unemployment has a role in health inequalities is by the fact that it's concentrated. So in the previous diagram we saw that there was a strong effect on mortality of unemployment and that that effect was particularly amongst uh, the lowest occupational groups. We can also see that actually the exposure to unemployment as a risk factor is not equal across social classes and actually people who are in the lowest educated groups, the lowest occupational groups, are more likely to experience unemployment than people who are in professional groups. So just by way of example, some work that I have done with a colleague, Frank Poppen from Glasgow, we looked at uh, data and we took, for example, the census in England and we looked at data from London. And you can see in 2001, which in London was a period of economic boom, so employment rates were very high by historical standards, you could see that over 80% of women with a degree, so highly educated women, had a job compared to only 50% or so of women with no qualifications. So a real difference there in terms of whether you're employed or not based on your educational level. We then looked at what role would these differences in employment have in terms of health inequalities. So we looked at the social gradient in health and when we adjusted for employment status we were able to reduce the social gradient by up to 80%. And this is demonstrated in these charts here. So we can see, and this one is looking for men, and we can see that in the um, darker bars is where we've looked at the difference in self-rated self general health by educational level, and of course no qualifications on the right is the lowest, and, and on this occasion level um, three is the highest. So that would be whether you've been to university or not. And we can see that um, the differences are much higher um, once you um, take into account employment status. And this is the same chart for women. And we, when we adjusted for whether people are employed or not in this, we were able to reduce this uh, gradient that you can see by up to 80%. And so it means that unemployment or lack of employment is playing a really important role in the social gradient of health. The next part that I want to focus on is health-related worklessness. And as I um, mentioned in the introduction, this is something where people are out of work because they've got a health condition. So we've looked at how unemployment, so being out of work, can lead to a health problem and can contribute to health inequalities. This is the other way, other side of the coin, and we're looking at how having a health problem leads to worklessness, to, to a form of unemployment in that sense. Um, and 
it's shown that people who develop a chronic health problem whilst in employment were t are twice as likely uh, to, to, to become workless, to, to, to fall out of the labour market um, uh, within a four-year period as those who remained healthy. That was some work um, conducted by some uh, collaborators of mine at the University uh, of Erasmus in Rotterdam. And we can see, and you probably know this from debates within Canada, but across the OECD, there's quite a high proportions of the workforce who are in this situation. So almost 6% across the OECD, around 7% in the UK, or over 2.5 million people are out of work due to a health-related problem, but are of working age, so under the age of 65 in our case. And... So this is why is this important in terms of the argument about work, worklessness and health? Well, I think it's important if people are losing out and unable to sustain work because of a health problem. Because as we've seen in the arguments around unemployment, work, of course, is a very important role to play in terms of your financial sustainability and also in terms of your psychosocial integration into society. And again, there is this issue of inequalities in worklessness, so inequalities in who falls out of the labour market. As you can see, I've produced a, another map here. Um, this is looking at England and Wales. And the darker areas are areas where there are higher rates of people who are out of the labour market because of they ha have a health condition. And the whiter areas are those are where they're lower, so below average versus uh, above average. And um, their standard illness ratios for, the, for people who, who are familiar with that kind of language which calculated similarly to standardised mortality ratios. If you remember the maps that I showed at the beginning when I talked about spatial inequalities in health, you'll begin to see a similar patterning here with darker colours in the north and lighter colours in the south. So there's a clear relationship between people who are out of the labour market and perhaps receiving benefits from the state, a disability pension, for example, um, and actual health need as um, measured by life expectancy in those older graphs. But what this also shows is, again, this spatial divide, these spatial inequalities reflecting perhaps socioeconomic inequalities as well. So health-related worklessness is unevenly spatially distributed and um, there are significant inequalities in what happens if you have experienced a health problem and whether you um, fall out of the labour market or not. And some data from um, uh, Margaret Whitehead and colleagues at Liverpool has examined how this might have changed and indeed this involves some colleagues from Canada as well. Um, Stats Canada were involved about how if you um, have a health problem and you lose your work um, how that has changed between the 1980s and now, so over a 20-year period. And they were particularly interested in looking at the contribution of these relationships to inequalities. So in this table, you can see that there's a difference in whether you were employed or not. So if you, on the first line, this is for men, if you were unwell, if you were, uh, had an illness and you had a low education, compared to people who had a low education but were healthy, then you could see the um, difference in your likelihood of having a job was over 50% in the mid-1980s. This had increased to a 65% difference um, in the mid-2000s. Perhaps most stark in this is the differences uh, between people on the bottom line. So if you had a low education and you had a health problem versus people who were high education and healthy, so this is kind of the two extremes, we can see a, a 10 percentage points change over time. So things have got a lot harder for people who have a health problem in terms of their integration into the workforce. And that might perhaps be something that we'd see as counterintuitive, um, given the changes in the legislative environment, for example, with the Disability Discrimination Act that we have in the UK. However, some research that I conducted with a colleague, uh, Daniel Pope, actually found that legislation like the Disability Discrimination Act, because it puts so much emphasis on the individual to make a claim and to stake their, uh, to, to set out to get their rights, it actually led to an increase over time in um, inequalities in the employment rate of people um, with a health or a disability uh, issue. So it's, the relationship's not straightforward, but we can see a change over time. It's been a negative change over time. And the overall pattern, both for the 80s and for now, suggests that it's much harder to have a job if you um, have a health problem. And also this is even harder if you have a low education as well. So there's a contribution uh, there to health inequalities.
In my introductory comments, I talked to, that there was two aspects to my argument. The first one was about how work and lack of work contributes to health and health inequalities, and I've set that out in the previous uh, discussion. The second point I wanted to make was that actually there is a kind of mediating role in this relationship for the wider uh, political economy welfare state context within which work and worklessness takes part. And it may be that for some aspects of my talk that's easier to understand than for others but I'm going to talk through a little bit about what I mean firstly by the welfare state context and then give a couple of examples of um, how uh, studies have shown the importance of welfare state context, context in mitigating some of the uh, effects of hazardous work on health and health inequalities. In this slide you can see that I've put up um, the countries of Europe into different types of welfare state regimes. This is based on a, a social policy research over the past 20 or 30 years, started by Espin Anderson and followed by others, that talks about types of welfare state or types um, or worlds of welfare state capitalism. And the idea is that different uh, countries um, have different types of welfare state, some of which are more generous, such as in the Scandinavian countries, some of which are more based on means testing and offer lower levels of benefits, such as the Anglo-Saxon countries, some which are more fragmented and don't provide uh, full coverage, such as the southern countries, and others which are more status and hierarchical in how they go about their benefits, such as the Bismarckian countries. In terms of Canada, whilst a lot of research is focused on Europe, um, Canada, Canadian research has tended to put Canada very closely with the UK. Um, and the welfare state systems have some similarities, a lot of differences, but obviously this is a macro perspective and I think it would be broadly fair to put Canada alongside the UK in this kind of macro level research. There's a huge literature around welfare states, which obviously I don't have time to talk to you about, and also about welfare states and health. And, and I would urge you, if you're interested, to look up some of that additional work. But what I want to look at here is, if we have countries with these broadly different contexts, so when you're out of work in um, Sweden, you might receive up to 70% of your previous pay, whereas in the UK, the replacement value of our um, unemployment benefit is more like 15% of an average worker's wage. We can begin to see how that might have an impact on how unemployment affects your health based on a material understanding of health and the social determinants of health. So my first example comes from colleagues that I've mentioned before, which is Nico Draganu from Dusseldorf. And they looked at how the effects of psychosocial work environment can vary um, depending on um, which type of welfare state you're in. So they found that stressful work environments were, had, had resulted in poorer mental, mental health in European, older European adults um, across Europe. And there was a, you know, an odds ratio of, of over two. However... The, the likelihood of ill health was greatest in countries like the UK and least likely in countries like Scandinavia. So the beginnings of a, and a welfare state effect. So you can be exposed to a stressful work environment, but whether it has a health effect or not uh, varies perhaps by this wider welfare state context. Indeed, um, they found in their analysis that different welfare state contexts accounted for 75% of um, differences between countries in stress levels, and that they concluded that the health effects of stressful work environments was less in these more generous welfare states. And they argued that higher levels of social uh, benefits and of employment protection conventionally associated with Scandinavia were probably offering the effects of stress and, uh, and, and the creation of a stressful work environment. So that's how work and worklessness, the effects that they have on health, can be mediated by the political economy uh, context. So that's my first example. The second example comes from some research that I conducted with Terry Ikemo, where we looked at the relationship between unemployment and health, so limiting long-term illness and self-reported health, again looking at Europe. And we found that there was a consistently poor relationship between unemployment and health across Europe. However, the inequalities between employed and unemployed were again largest in the Anglo-Saxon countries. 
Our findings were supported by some work by Rodriguez, some earlier work, where he looked at the UK, Germany and the USA as offering contrasting types of systems. So the UK offers a very low level and sometimes means tested benefits. Germany tends to offer even means tested benefits or ones um, attached to previous earnings and contributions. And often in the USA, um, many people would get social assistance or they might miss out on benefits altogether. And in this research, they found that it was uh, help, the ill health effects of unemployment were very much associated with the means tested benefits, not with those that people had got through contribution. So this begins to suggest that um, the relationship between unemployment and poorer health is material, but it's also to psychosocial. So there's a stigma attached to means tested benefits, and often the means tested benefits can be of a lower level than those that are um, contribution based. So again, the example is that unemployment has a consistently negative effect, but it has a more negative effect in certain contexts than in others. And the third example is looking at worklessness, and this is research by Kirtel van der Vel uh, from Norway. And again, they were looking at this issue of how people with health problems have lower employment rates than those who are healthy. And they compared it by country, and they found that the employment rates of people with a health problem or a disability were actually higher in countries that invested through their welfare state in active labour market policies, so the Scandinavian countries, compared to those that, that took a more laissez-faire approach, such as the Anglo-Saxon countries of the UK and Ireland. And indeed, research by David Stuckler has also shown that these active labour market policies can be really important uh, in terms of the effects of things like unemployment. So he found that in Sweden, the well-known association between um, suicide rates going up as unemployment rates go up in a country has been broken in Sweden. And this seems to be largely to do with the role of their active labour market policies, helping people to reintegrate into the labour market, largely through training or medical rehabilitation. So there are three examples from a very wide literature that shows that the welfare state context, the context within which work is experienced, within which work environments are created, within which worklessness is experienced, can have an important mediating role on the health effects that work and worklessness have, and indeed on their contributions to health inequalities. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to conclude now. And my concluding comments are that the distribution of the physical and psychosocial working conditions of unemployment and of worklessness are very important determinants of health inequalities. They're kind of mid-level social determinants, but they in themselves are shaped by macro-level uh, political economy of welfare states. And, and so there is lower exposure to hazardous environments within uh, stronger welfare states of Scandinavia, and also less health effects, for example, of stressful work environments within these countries, partly as a result of their welfare state and partly a result of higher workplace regulation. This leads me to conclude, and I do uh, argue this more in my book, that if we want to reduce health inequalities and improve population health for everyone within Anglo-Saxon countries like the UK or Canada, then this does require us to think not just about intervening in the workplace, but also about how we wish to shape our wider society and the context with which we all live, um, work uh, and age. And this is, of course, is just my final plug for my book, which if you enjoyed the talk, I think you might also enjoy the book. And thank you very much for your concentration.